This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 152, recorded on May 11th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Hi, everybody. How have you been? Well? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Is the weather great out there? No, actually, of all things, huh. it rained a couple of days ago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Would you believe the Padres baseball team was rained out for the third time in history? <laughs> wow. That's good to have anyhow, rain. They they're not playing too well anyhow. So Might, as well, rain out. Might as well rain them Might out. Might as well rain out. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How about that? They were rained out only for the third time in history. I don't know how many years they've been playing, but the Cubs well, the enough. Cubs are doing very well in Chicago. But we're not speaking of it for fear we'll jinx them. Did they, they could repeat. Did they, they win could the world? Repeat. They won the World Series, right? They won the World Series. All right. Well, Michelle is absent today, so it's the three of us who will forge on and give you your biweekly dose of microbiology. Is that right? Biweekly is every other week. It's either every other week or twice a week. It's ambiguous. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, biannual. Same thing with biannual. Hmm. Well, you can get TWIM every other week, so we'll give you your every other week dose of microbiology. But before we start, I want to tell you about ASM Microbe 2017. This is the annual meeting taking place June 1st through 5th in New Orleans, Louisiana. And this meeting will provide a unique platform to explore the full scope of microbial sciences. ASM Microbe 2017 will feature an exciting program with opportunities for you to gain great new science and connections. Whether you're a researcher or educator, a clinical or applied microbiologist, an infectious disease or environmental microbiology expert, explore the complete spectrum of microbiology at ASM Microbe 2017. For more information, go to asm.org slash microbe. And by the way, we're going to be doing live TWIM and live TWIV. Now we had a little change in the schedule, but let me just tell you the both TWIM and TWIV will be recorded on the, in the exhibit and poster hall. All right. Remember that's a big place where all the, well, first of all, the posters are there and then all the exhibitors, all the companies that have their stuff, they're down there too. And, and buried among them, ASM has a couple of booths and that's what we're going to do Twiv and Twim. It's not a tiny booth. It's a pretty big place. <laughs> it's booth number 1737. So Twim is going to be Sunday, June 4th, 2.30 p.m. in the in the exhibit hall. And Twiv will be Saturday, 2.30 in the same place. So you should come see us because me and Alio and Michael Schmidt and, and Michelle Swanson will all be there for Twim. And I'll be there with Rich Condit for Twiv. And we'll have we'll have great guests. So you should come see us. The schedule as printed is different. Okay, so listen to us here. Twim is on Sunday, with is Saturday. Okay. Now we have two papers. You, you've been training for Twim. You've been, been training. <laughs> I mean done Twiv the day before. That's right. I'll be training. How many Twiv how many Twiv have you done? Four hundred and forty. How many? Quattrocento quaranta. Accidenti. <laughs> That's a lot. Four hundred and forty. Can you now? You know the ropes. <laughs> well, I don't know. I I mean, I don't get too nervous anymore. That's one thing. Um, I've learned to listen to people. By when, the way, I have a word for. Uh, I, I invented a new word. I want to try it out on you, and it has <laughs> to do with the cuisine of New Orleans. You know how something is heartfelt. Yes. Well, the cuisine in New Orleans will be gastro felt. <laughs> That's great. That's very good. That is true. Maybe we should use that as our twim title. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to seeing everyone there. That should be fun. Today we have two papers about symbioses. Actually, the whole world's a symbiosis, right, Elio? 
Absolutely. Listen, unavoidable. And here on Twim, we're a symbiosis, right? We we help each other, although we don't yes, we don't live inside of each other. And today we're going to talk about those kinds. Uh, and uh, Elio is going to start us off with a snippet about really big shipworms. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, actually, really big, but not really shipworms. Here's the story: shipworms. Let's start with that. Uh, we talked about it in a previous uh, twin, didn't we? That's right. I'll have to put those uh, in the show notes, yeah. Yeah. So we talked about it because the um, these guys eat wood, and of course they don't digest it themselves. They need bacteria to help them. They don't have termites in their gut, by the way, but termites also can do it. They also need bacteria. Anyhow, um, the per- point of that previous post was the odd fact that you would expect this bacteria to be in the GI tract of the worms. Not so. They're in the gills. Mm. The GI tract is practically sterile, and what these bacteria do is they send their enzymes via a special mechanism down to the gut, where they do their thing. Isn't that amazing? Uh, that's right. I remember that now. Yep, yep. That that was just we were just amazed by that. Well, it's stunning. I mean, who who thinks of biology that way? I mean, we think that God meant the gut to be the place where the bacteria do the digesting, right? Oh, yeah. But yep. they don't. Yep. Okay, so now I have a different story. This is also, this is a related worm. It is not wood feeding, at least not now. And let me tell you, it lives in mud, not in wood. And it has, a, the paper, by the way, is by a bunch of authors, about 20 authors. I'll give you the first one, who's Daniel Distel, and the last one, who's Margot Haygood. I know Margot. She is a fine, extraordinary marine biologist. And this still has had a lot to do with these shipworms and theories about how they evolved. So the story is, first of all, this ship, this worm, not a shipworm, but related to them, uh, is, grows in, you find it in the mud of brackish waters and dirty places. And it is huge. I mean, by huge, I mean gigantic, huge. <laughs> it is up to one and a half meters in length and up to six centimeters in diameter. And it's contained within a, a calcium carbonate shell. When the shells wash ashore, people thought there must be narwhal teeth or something like that. They couldn't <laughs> believe that this would be the encasings of worms. So the story about this worm, in brief, is that it, it is a, capable of digesting all kinds of stuff using sulfide as the material to be oxidized, to be reduced, I'm sorry. So it makes... No, you're right, oxidized. Oxidized. Ah, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Some days. Uh, anyhow, it takes H2S converted into sulfate, which is a way of obtaining energy. So that's pretty much the story. The worm, uh, by the way, I found in... It's found in the Philippine waters, among other places, and I found a fantastic uh, Filipino television program <laughs> in what must be Tagalog, the language in the Philippines, and it shows people catching these worms and eating them raw. So that's not a point of this paper, which is a PNAS paper. They don't talk about such things. But they, it's an interesting factoid, anyhow. So the, this guy has a collection of symbionts. It reminds you a lot of the tube worms which are found in the hydro, in the hot vents of the oceans, and which also have a whole lot of bacteria, which use H2S to generate energy. So they probably evolved into wood-boring worms by first starting out eating material and using it as autotrophs to become eventually heterotrophs. And they call this the wooden step theory, kind of cute. So it, it goes through wood in order to get to wood, something like that. So uh, there is more to be said, but um, so wood deposits have acted as ecological stepping stones, uh, introducing the autotrophs to the deep sea vent hydrotherms, hydro- hydrothermal vents, and facilitating maybe the migration between them. Mm. So it's an interesting story. The worms, the paper is fun in all forms, not the least of which it shows you what these worms look like. In both in reality and in uh, schematic, the mouth is down in the bottom of the sediment where the food is, and they have siphons 
which stick out in the water column where they, they exchange gases, presumably. And the bacteria are contained in a gill-like, not exactly gills, but something like it, in a special organ which extends the length of the worm. And there's a video, by the way, which shows the dissection of one of these worms. <laughs> they had to use a scalpel to remove the end of the calcium tube in which the worm is contained. It's almost like opening a soft-boiled egg. They they tap right. on the calcium carbonate just like you do with a chicken egg to get at the soft center. Good point. That's right. Anyhow, but what they end up is with an egg that's all, all very long and about three feet, what, six feet long. No, five feet, four feet, something like that. Huge. So it's an interesting story. It deserves to be in PNAS. I enjoyed reading it. And um, it's part of what we have to learn about microbial ecology and the importance of bacteria in the evolution of animals. So these live in, in marine sediments, is that correct? It's marine sediments, which I think are brackish. Or, mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are they taking in to digest? Well, they take in whatever they can. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, they're orotrophs, so you know, they, don't, they don't need to take in organic material. They just take in CO2, which somehow they get through the siphon, the water, water in, in the ocean contains yeah. a fair amount of CO2. So they they are effectively eating reduced inorganic compounds. Got it. And right. and the hydrogen right. sulfide is the hallmark from the hydrothermal vents. But here, these little creatures are eating some some other reduced forms of sulfur, and they're they're making their living uh, effectively burning sulfur rather than carbon. And right. what results is the worm getting larger and larger. But from the perspective of folks going out and eating them raw, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't actually enjoy the smell of H2S. And I cannot imagine <laughs> what this stuff must taste like. Well, yeah. wait, they made the H2S get, get, gets, reduced, gets oxidized. So, you know, yeah, it gets oxidized, but H2S, yeah. there's. There's always got to be something around it. It could be like almost rotten eggs hmm. because if, if, you know, eggs can sometimes go off as well. So it, I, I found it to be a fascinating story and, and to really reintroduce everyone to the concept of uh, chemolithotrophy and autotrophy, which is probably one of the older behaviors that microbes had. And That's it right. really formed to terraform our planet and mm. uh, heterotrophs are a recent event when there was much more preformed carbon around. So, so Elio, basically they did some sequencing uh, of the, uh, of the area where the bacteria are and they find strains that are able to oxidize sulfur, right? That's right. That's right. And therefore, um, they tell you a lot about it. Gram negative bacteria. Mm. They tell you exactly where they belong. They are, there's a little, uh, phylogenetic tree that shows you that they are related to other endosymbionts, mm -hmm. other beasts. And these are part of a of a uh, family. The family is called Pteridinidae. That's right. And these are this is these are all sh called shipworms because related members are actually shipworms that burrow into the wood of ships, right? Correct. Yeah. And you know we didn't say the title of this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, tell us the title. Discovery of chemoautotrophic symbiosis. In the giant shipworm, Cufus polysalamia, belongs to the bivalvia or pteridinidae, and then extends wooden step theory. So the wooden step theory is in the title. Hmm. So this is the first time they figured out that these big worms were able to do this, right? That's right. Considering where they live and that they don't ingest anything, we would, you would predict it would be something like this, right? I guess. <laughs> I thought it was okay. Yeah, and and what was really nice about the paper is the in their abstract in the first sentence they give you the wooden steps hypothesis and they give you the reference of Distal, the first author from 2000, which was a Nature paper, proposed that large chemosynthetic mussels found at deep sea hydrothermal vents descend from much smaller species associated with sunken wood mm. and other organic deposits that endosymbiotes of these progenitors made use of hydrogen sulfide from biogenic sources, Got it. for example, decaying wood, rather than from the vent 
fluid. So that's where the wooden steps comes into, if you will, the evolution is walking down the decaying wood to the deep sea vent to evolve these giant tube worms that are living off of the gases of hydrogen sulfide that are percolating out of the volcanic earth. Mm, So that's where the wooden steps came from. And I really appreciated that the author or the editor, whoever made them put that in as their first sentence, because that's what effectively hooked me as I began to look at this paper. And it's interesting that they end the paper with the sentence, I'm going to read the sentence, because it, it, it sort of poses the question again. So they end by saying, could wood, which can simultaneously serve both as a substrate for heterotrophic and thioautotrophic metabolism, also have helped to bridge the gap between heterotrophic and thioautotrophic metabolism for other chemosynthetic animals. Mm. So they think that this may be a more generalized phenomenon, possibly. We'll hear more about this. It's sort of interesting that wood can serve this function, you know, but in, in the ocean you don't expect that much wood, but, you know, it comes down, especially in coastal areas, it comes down from the shores where trees are swept away by by rivers, mm-hmm. but uh, it's not the normal way of thinking about the ocean. The deep oceans probably have only the very occasional bit of wood from the sinking of a ship. That doesn't happen very often. It's not the way you can sustain a, a biome. So. Especially how deep these vents are. These vents are what, 10,000 to 14,000 feet right. deep? Right. And, um, when I appreciated that lesson, since I said to myself, it's not as elegant as one of the Talmudic questions that you have on the Small Things Considered blog, but it's certainly a, a sufficiently provocative question to put on graduate student comprehensive exams to see if they can explain autotrophy and heterotrophy and how the two are are different. It's a, a good one sentence question that really would test the knowledge of a graduate student as they prepare for their qualifying exam. All right. So let me let me attempt to make the uh, overview summary of this paper and why we're excited about it. Um, this paper uh, st- studies the giant, this giant, what they call a shipworm, but as Elio said, it's not really a shipworm, which lives in marine sediments and contains symbiotic bacteria that allow it to consume uh, hydrogen sulfide. Is that right? Yep. Yes. And make the organic molecules that they need to survive out of that. And this is, uh, this is chemosynthetic, right? It's the Calvin cycle without light. Calvin cycle without light. And the other part that's, that's really cool is that they, by sequencing the bacteria, they suggest that the symbiosis originally started in an ancestor of this worm that used to eat wood. And by displacing the bacteria that would help digest the wood with these sulfur oxidizing bacteria. And that's the wooden steps idea. Wood served as an evolutionary stepping stone for the transition from heterotrophy to chemoautotrophy. Now, if you don't know what those words mean, so chemoautotrophy is what we're doing in, in this big worm. You're taking hydrogen sulfide and making uh, other chemicals that you need for life, right? Yep. Right. And heterotrophy, you're taking organic material and wood and breaking it down. Is that correct? And reassembling right. it into your building blocks. That's right. So they're not really that those too difficult uh, at all, those words. Now, the word thioautotrophic just means that you're using sulfur as the uh, chemical to do your autotrophy, right? Eat sulfur. Right. That's exactly what that means. Eat sulfur. Thio yeah. autotrophy. Okay. That's your summary. And I think it's pretty interesting. And it just goes to show you need to study all kinds of weird things to find out all about life, right? Indeed. Yep. All right. It was great. I love it. Thank you, Elio. Yep. All right. I have another paper which deals with symbionts, but these are endo symbionts. These are bacteria that these are not bacteria in this case, microbes that live within the cells of another organism. And uh, the paper was published in eLife. It's called transcriptome analysis illuminates 
Oops, I lost it. Illuminates the nature of the intracellular interaction in a vertebrate algal symbiosis. It's by John Burns, Wajia Zhang, Elizabeth Hill, Unso Kim, and Ryan Kearney. And they're from the Division of Invertebrate Biology, Zoology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, as well as the Sackler Institute for Comparative Genomics and the American Natural History Museum as well in the Department of Biology at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, U.S. Now, if you thought that the American Museum of Natural History was just dusty models of animals, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Because they're doing you a new thing coming. It's right. They they have a they have a genomics department where they sequence all sorts of things. Because after all, that's how we illuminate evolution these days. We sequence genomes, and so uh, they actually have great exhibits there, all about DNA and so forth. So if you're ever here in New York City, go check it out. Now I have to say, Gettysburg College. What famous Nobel laureate went to Gettysburg College? And I'll have you. I'll give you a clue. He's a virologist. Anyone know? No. J. Michael Bishop. No. Mr. RNA. So Mike Bishop went there, and uh, I interviewed him a couple of years ago. He spent a lot of time talking about uh, his experience at Gettysburg College. So it's a nice, small liberal arts institution with a strong science component. And as you can see, uh, the, some of the authors are from there on this paper. All right, so this paper is about... Um, endosymbioses, where microbes live within the vertebrates. Now, most of the time in vertebrates, these kinds of uh, endosymbioses are parasitic. So think malaria, toxoplasma, the chytrid fungi. They, they're living uh, within them, but they're parasitic. Now, in this case... In fact... Yes. Yes. Go ahead. In fact, this is really news because... Well, you go ahead. I'm sure you're going to tell us that <laughs> this was not suspected. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like to hear your take on it. Well, if you had asked before this paper or before a series of papers like this, uh, are there any endosymbionts other than parasites and other than mitochondria and chloroplasts mm -hmm. in uh, eukaryotic organisms, the answer would have been, we don't know of any. Right. Now, here, the, the story or the association is an old one, but what's new in, in, in this business is that it was found that these guys are actually intracellular. That's right. Extracellular combinations are plentiful. Sure. These are intracellular. So the point is, you heard it here, <laughs> there are eukaryotes that have endosymbiotic symbionts. That's right. Now, in, in this paper, the authors say there's one known situation where a microbe lives within a eukaryote, and that's the green alga Oophila amblostomatitis, living in cells of the salamander. Stomatis, not, not stomatitis. So I'm thinking of vesicular <laughs> stomatitis. <laughs> you create a new disease. <laughs> Ambulostomatis. Ambulostomatis, right. The salamander is called Ambistoma maculatum, and these alga enter early in development. And, um, Years ago, whole culture experiments showed that the algae, the algae benefit the salamander embryos. Uh, now, uh, Elio brought to my attention another paper in PLOS One, which shows there are other uh, algo endosymbionts, um, one in a different salamander, uh, and then one in a wood frog, and one in a red-legged frog. And in that PLOS One paper, they actually show that these algae are within the cells of these uh, organisms. So, you know, we they're didn't... They're all amphibians, by the way. They're all but amphibians. doesn't it make you wonder whether... Surely, if they find it in four amphibians, uh, two different big groups, frogs and salamanders, surely there must be many more, don't you think? Absolutely. I, I would think. And, you know, these have been right under our noses for years, and we didn't figure this out. So, um, well, we're we should, just... We should look at salamanders more often. We should. <laughs> Uh, well, like, we didn't. In fairness, we didn't have the tools. The I tools mean, they're are, they're they're using some very sophisticated RNA seq methods that really didn't come down in price and utility and ubiquity in in modern laboratories for for probably the last three years. So mm -hmm. it, it, it it's it's only because our methods are getting better that we're beginning to truly appreciate the wonder 
of this symbiosis. And I won't spoil Vincent's uh, news here that he's going to take us through. So this paper, they study the algae within this particular salamander. The idea is that the algae grows in the salamander egg capsules with embryos in them, and the algae get nitrogenous waste from the embryo, and in turn, the algae provide oxygen, and, and the authors in the beginning say products of photosynthesis. But as you will see, not, not so clear that there's photosynthesis mm -hmm. going on. Right. It may be too dark in the salamander <laughs> for mm -hmm. that to happen. But the salamander is definitely getting a benefit because it gets rid of its nitrogenous waste. And what the alga wants is it's desperate for nitrogen because, remember, if you think about where mm. these things are, they're in water. And nitrogen is often very dilute. So yes. this is truly yep. an adaptation for both creatures. You get rid of your trash and then another organism eats your trash and helps it. So it's a win-win. It's great recycling. Yep. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit about what's known about endosymbioses between photosynthetic microbes and other animal hosts. For example, there are known ones between corals and sea anemones and dinoflagellate endosymbionts. These are dinoflagellants or marine plankton, but they can also be found in fresh water. So they are within the corals and the sea anemones. And people have studied those, and both the host and the, and the symbiont show changes when they associate with each other. For example, the host has a reduced immune response to the incoming cells, and they, they turn on genes that help transfer nutrients to and from the endosymbiont. That makes perfect sense, right? Because if you're going to give things and take things back, you have to put on the proper genes. That's basically what they wanted to do in this study. What are the changes at the RNA level, the mRNA level, in the host and in the algae when they're together compared to when they're not together? All right, and they use RNA-seq, which means you take total RNA, convert it to cDNA, and then you sequence the whole thing, and you sort through all the sequences, and you say which genes are changed, okay? So what they do is they have free-living algal cells within the egg capsule, and then they have salamander cells with and without intracellular algae, all right? So the egg capsule is not intracellular yet. At some point, they're going to go within cells. But in the egg capsule, of course, they are, they are able to photosynthesize because they're on the outside of the egg. Uh, and so those are considered free swimming. And then they have salamander cells with and without intracellular algae. So they extract total RNA. They do the sequencing. And they end up with 46,500 salamander genes and 6,700 algal genes to study. Here, here's what they found. Among the algal genes, 277 were different. So that's out of uh, 6,700. 111 went up when the algae went into cells, and 166 went down when the algae go into the salamander cells. And they, they can take these genes and put them in categories and say, what are they doing? And what they see is that when algae go inside shells, cells, they are stressed. <laughs> they show a stress response. They overexpress heat shock proteins, autophagy-related proteins, and a whole bunch of other indicators of oxidative and osmotic stress. And that's compared happy to... Happy they ain't. They're not happy. You know? Maybe maybe one reason why they don't do much photosynthesis, other than not having enough light, they're pretty sick. Yeah, they are sick. They're stressed. And their metabolic changes... Well, it's not a perfect two-way symbiosis, is it? It's no. no. It's not, the, al the algae is suffering a little. <laughs> No, it's not perfect. Nothing in life is perfect, is it? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> but, you know, usually you find, in the case of corals and other things, these ectosymbiotic relationships are pretty healthy. Yeah. So yeah. this is a little bit off beat in that sense. Now, in the salamander, 300 genes were differentially expressed. 134 went up when the salamanders had algae in them and 166 genes went down. The largest category of differentially expressed genes, expressed genes are transposable elements. I'll get back to that in a minute. These are mobile DNAs that move around the genome, and other categories include genes related to the immune response, nutrient sensing, cell survival, and, and adhesion and motility. So then they wanted to know, can we do an experiment that would validate any of these genes? So they did a very nice experiment where... They look at the regulation of transporters for phosphate and nitrogen. So these are membrane proteins, and they 
uh, are important for bringing in phosphate and nitrogen into the algae, all right? And what they find, they found, they looked at one phosphate transporter. It's called the high affinity phosphate transporter. It's regulated by inorganic phosphate. So they do an experiment where they simply add more and more phosphate to the medium. So they're growing algae in medium. And they look at the expression of this transporter by RNA-seq. The more phosphate, the less transporter expression. And that makes sense because you have yeah. more around. You don't need to have transporters to pull it in, right? It's a beautiful experiment, by the way. The, the data is just gorgeous. And this result agrees with the RNA-seq data, which shows this transporter shows lower expression in endosymbiotic algae where the phosphate concentrations are much higher than they are in water, right? So that's that's what Elia was referring to before. Maybe Michael, I don't remember, but they're living in water. It's the other limiting reagent. Yeah, phosphate is limiting in, in water. They also looked at nitrogen transporters, and these are, are repressed by glutamine, which by two millimolar glutamine, which is the concentration in the cytoplasm of amphibian cells. And that also agrees with their RNA-seq data, showing that nitrogen transporters are repressed when the algae get within cells. So basically, you come into a restaurant and you're no longer hungry because <laughs> there's plenty to eat. <laughs> and, and the trade-off for the poor little algae being sick is the fact that it's getting two essential macronutrients that it desperately needs to reproduce. Absolutely. Right. Because without phosphate, there is no DNA, and without nitrogen, there is no DNA. That's right. There's nothing. <laughs> now, they let's look at these metabolic genes, uh, how they have changed. Basically, the algae switch, the, the changes in the gene expression strongly suggest that the algae are switching from oxidative metabolism, using oxygen to make energy from sugars, to fermentative metabolism, no oxygen. And they suggest that the photosynthesis of the algae can't keep up with the demand for oxygen, probably because, you know, once they're inside the salamander cells, they're pretty opaque and they can't get enough photons to do photosynthesis. What do you think? Does that sound reasonable? That sounds reasonable. The oxygen, as the algae no longer photosynthesizes, the oxygen tension drops. And so it shifts from an oxidative metabolism where oxygen's the terminal electron acceptor to an organic acid that yeah. it dumps its waste electrons into. So it's, again, beautifully following form after function. If you turn off the lights, you're going to have to dump your waste into something else. Yep. Now, they also say that... Go ahead. But it does ask the question, really, what's ultimate, what's in it for, for the salamander? It's not clear. I mean, uh, granted, this That's is all true. on the embryo level. We have to remember this, and we're not talking about adult salamanders so much. We're talking about the embryos, which are encased. That's in right. The That's membrane. right. But uh, it's a little bit tricky here, I think. And I think yeah, we is, haven't got, we haven't gotten to what's in it for the salamander yet. That right. that's absolutely true. So let's look at the salamander. What happens? As I said, the most uh, changed genes are those are transposable elements. And here they talk a little bit about this. It turns out that the salamander genome is 10 times the size of the human genome. Oh my gosh, the human genome is 3 billion base pairs, right? Mm hmm. 30 billion is the salamander. And the difference is mainly movable. DNA elements, transposable elements, which have multiplied over the years, and that's what makes up the difference. And they think that these elements share regulatory regions with protein coding genes are that are changed when you know the algae comes into the salamander, and so they're just they don't think they're really relevant to uh, any of the changes in the salamander. Uh, the, the salamander cells show apoptosis, and they can see transcripts that might be involved in suppressing it. I'm sorry, the salamander cells show no clear signs of apoptosis. And dying. Dying, program dying. cell death. Dying. And they think, which, which you might expect happens if, a, if an algae comes into your cytoplasm, and they think that they can see transcripts of genes that may be involved in suppressing uh, program cell death. The, the salamanders also have a limited immune response to the algae, they do see some cytokines and chemokines going up, uh, and they think that they can also see regulation of genes, upregulation of genes that are involved in, in modulating immune responses. So there is a muted controlled immune response, which I guess the idea would be that you're not going to kick out the algae, 
if there's some value to it, uh, the immune response doesn't kick it out. Or selection is 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 holding it in. Right. Because if you kicked them out, you you're you wouldn't grow up to be an adult salamander and give progeny. So there's well, you some don't reason. That. Wait a you, you don't you don't quite know that. Yeah, well, that's a good no. question. I don't know. Is the, if you can you take the algae out, or can you grow oh, really? salamanders? Haven't done that. Can you grow salamanders no. without algae? You haven't done that, right? Uh, no, they did. They did not do that. Yeah, that would be the experiment to see if they can grow. I'm not familiar with. I don't with know how you do it. How would you do it? You can't feed salamanders and kill kill the algae selectively. Maybe you could. Uh, maybe you could raise them in uh, the lab where there are no algae and uh, take sing- oh, I see. take yeah. single cells algae free. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, they don't they don't mention it, which suggests that it's very hard to do. But uh, that would be obviously the experiment. See if you can make salamanders without algae. Now, they suggest that maybe the intracellular algae prime the immune system of the salamander to protect it against other microbes that might be coming in. So you have this low level of immune system activation, which we've seen in other systems, and that's kind of mm-hmm. an interesting idea. Um, in but the, isn't it also the case that eventually the algae disappear? That's right. The, salamander, the embryos develop? That's that's correct. It's, it's not in, so they're not in the algae. adults. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you know, it's a transit. If they're important, if they're important, they're important for the early stages of development of the egg. That's why I say if you took an adult salamander, you could make eggs from that without algae, right. and then in the laboratory you could see if they develop. Sure. Um, I'm sure that must have been done. Yeah. All right, a couple more things: metabolism. There, there are changes in salamander genes involved in sensing nutrient. So they think maybe you know if you want to acquire something from the algae, you. Uh, you turn on genes that are involved in sensing the, the nutrients. And the other thing they see is uh, a surface protein on the salamander called lipoprotein-related protein 2. It's upregulated, and they think this might be a receptor for entry of the algae into cells. And so maybe if the algae bind this receptor, they're taken up into the salamander by endocytosis, then they say they have to get out of the vacuole because when they do, when they look at pictures of these of these uh, embryos, there's no membrane around the algae. And in fact, they find that lipases are overexpressed in the invaded salamander, and they suggest this might take off the membrane. So that's a cool idea. I don't know if you can do uh, genetic targeting of these uh, animals, but if you could, you could address all these things. And they do wonder if the alga benefits from this interaction. They say there's no evidence for vertical transmission, right? Mm-hmm. And so, maybe, although don't they find the algae? Wait a minute, am I thinking of this paper or another paper? <laughs> don't they find the algae in the um, uh, in the ovaries or someplace? Let me look here. They they mention this uh, in the discussion. Let me see where that comes here. Here, I think they do. Vertical. We found. Okay, so in a previous study, we found evidence consistent with vertical transmission. Right. But now, today, we have not found con- conclusive evidence for vertical transmission of the alga from one generation to the next. As such, any benefit to the alga in this endosymbiotic re- interaction remains unknown. What did you so say? So that would make it hard. It would make it hard to rear the eggs without the algae, if that's the case. Yes. Yes. What did you say? They were in the ovaries? They're in the, yeah, they're in the reproductive tract. Mm. In the adult. That's right. They find them. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. But they're not passed on to the offspring. They may be. No, no, they are probably. That they don't I don't think they know that. Well, is, they just oh, uh, it's odd, but I don't think that's huh. Well, I had, let me read this again. Um hang on. Here we go. Look. Whether the alga benefits from the symbiosis interaction remains unclear. Similar questions persist for the symbiosis between the bobtail squid and the bacterium alivibrio, fisher eye. That's Margaret McFall Nye's story there. Um, in a previous study, we found evidence consistent with vertical transmission. Algal ribosomal DNA was amplified from, yeah, adult oviducts and wolfian yep. ducts, and insisted right. algal cells were found in the egg capsules of freshly laid eggs. However, to date, we there have not go. found conclusive evidence for vertical transmission from one generation uh, to the next. So you were both right. So you can see them there, but they don't get transmitted to the next generation. Oh, they may. They may. They don't know. They don't know. They have no evidence, they said. Yeah. Right. All right. 
So, so here's this, the uh, executive summary. Life in the vertebrate cytoplasm induces stress responses in algae. Uh, they benefit from high phosphate and nitrogen, but um, they're limited in oxygen and sulfur, so they get osmotically stressed. The salamander re recognized the algae as foreign, but does not m mount an eliminating immune response. Uh, and the question is whether the salamander receives nutritional benefit from the algae. So this is a very unusual situation where we have an endosymbiont of a um, eukaryotic, uh, of a vertebrate. And um, there are just a few of those salamanders and uh, frogs of different sorts. The, the idea here is that this technology allows you to study this, in particular exactly. the RNA-seq. They, they did a beautiful piece of work. I mean, this is really yeah. very elegant. Oh. It's very and nice. they finish everything off with a beautiful figure for oh, the those of you. Great. Yes, figures. Uh, this this is the last figure in the paper, and it takes you through all of their experiments, effectively highlighting them in a beautiful format on nutrient up uptake, what happens with algal hypoxia and sulfur starvation, how the algal releases the metabolites, and then what the host or the salamander is doing. Uh, with respect to its immune system, what factors are going up, which ones are blocked, and so it's it's really it's beautiful, a beautiful, but a, simple it ain't. Yeah, simple it ain't. There's a no, lot of it, it, there's a lot of arrows, <clears throat> but this is eLife, so it's open access, yeah. so everybody can see this. And um, if you want, you could go take a look at it. Although it is not simple, as Helio no. said. All right, let's do a couple of email before saying goodbye to you. We have one from Anthony who sends a link to two articles about um, wound infections are common after crocodile attacks and therefore prophylactic antimicrobial therapy is advised. However, there are limited data to guide recommendations for the optimal empirical regimen. How do you know if you're going to be bit by a crocodile? I know. Yes, crocodile Dundee. <laughs> The one article is in the Medical Journal of Australia, The Microbiology of Crocodile Attacks in Far North Queensland. Wow. Implications for Empirical Antimicrobial Therapy. It's behind a paywall, so I can't see that one. The other one is in the Brisbane Times. Infections caused by crocodile bites are under the microscope in a new report. So these, uh, this report, which I couldn't see, uh, they looked at the medical records of 14 of 15 patients who were attacked by crocodiles after 1990, they were aged eight years old to 70 years old. Oh, my gosh. And um, they, they swabbed their wounds, and uh, they found that uh, a lot of these patients had surgery, of course, to repair the wounds, and many of them required repeated debridement to remove dead tissue because I guess they were... Um, necrotic. Necrotic, right? Yeah. Well, on Easter Sunday here in Charleston... A family wakes up and they're living on the marsh and they hear some thrashing out on their screened in porch. And it turned out a 13 foot alligator had climbed up the the flight of stairs, entered their screen porch mm. and was rummaging around. So they thought it was the Easter Bunny, but it turned out to be a giant alligator. Wow. So <laughs> they called animal control to remove the gator and uh, it took much cajoling and co coaching, and, and they eventually got it to go down the stairs. But um, uh, the poor alligator is now someone's shoes, I think. Oh, uh, it, 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 did, it, it didn't lend itself to being captured and relocated. But it didn't bite anybody. It didn't bite anyone. So we have no way mm -hmm. of asking the question, does it happen in alligators? So but, in this case, the, you know, the bacteria come from the mouth of the crocodiles. So. Yes, they infect the wounds, and there aren't so many cases, so it's hard to know what to treat them with, right? Yeah. Uh, James writes, guys, episode 150 was the best episode I've heard so far, having listened for a couple of years now, I guess. I absolutely loved hearing about science jobs and the intersection of pure science, medicine, and patients. I will add, that is my favorite part of TWIP, too. Just awesome. That's, of course, uh, referring to the episode with Robin Patel. Robin Patel. Thank you, Michael. I've written before, but this episode really hit me. As a displaced and more or less retired pharma rep with a double major in biology and chemistry, I'm actually going to look into the possibility of a career change 
to medical laboratory technologist. It might be too late for me at 52 and being in a wheelchair, but it is so very interesting to me that I feel like I need to do my due diligence to see if it might be a fit for me in some way. Thanks for all you guys do on all the Twix programs. All the best, James. You should try it. That's a, that was a, a great testimony to Robin Patel and all of our colleagues in the, the clinical laboratory that are worked tirelessly every day. I don't know if being in a wheelchair would be a problem because you could pull nope. right up to the bench there and do your work, right? Yep. No problem. Check it out, James. Don't, don't give up. Uh, Peter writes, Dear Twimmers, here is my listener's pick of the week, a video from the New York Times portraying a biohacker who attempted to replace all his bacteria. And they send a link to this. It's actually a video. So this this fellow um, had all kinds of uh, intestinal problems all his life. He decided to uh, replace his bacteria, and he had it filmed. I made a little 12-minute video out of it. Basically, took he went into a hotel room, took a lot of um, antibiotics, and then that gave himself a fecal transplant. Maybe you already know it. I wonder what your thoughts are about that possible project. Keep on the fantastic Twix work. My many greetings again from Wiesbaden, in Germany. Peter, still the high school teacher for natural sciences. What do we think about doing your own um, fecal transplant? You well, got to know what you're doing. <laughs> you you got to know, know what you're doing. doing. Well, yeah, I mean. It's, it's difficult to know what you're doing at best. With fecal transplants, leave alone doing it yourself. So I mean, you really want to go to sources where the uh, the, the uh, transplanted, the thought to be transplanted, has been looked at and you know investigated for viruses and things like that. I would not suggest that you do it yourself. I think it's a very bad idea. And in fact, work. the only it could good work, data but it we... could be very dangerous. The only good data we have on efficiency of uh, FMT, as it's called in the the jargon, fecal microbial transfer or transplant, is for C. diff, which is really an outlier because this is an organism that literally takes over the end of your large intestine. It manifests a toxin, and as long as you're able to display C. diff from that niche, it it really doesn't matter who's in the mix as long as they're able to engraft and take hold and displace the C. diff. Mm-hmm. We don't know, and there haven't been any really good clinical trials released yet establishing, you know, can you use a fecal microbial transplant to improve your your processing of food so that you have a a lean phenotype versus a fat phenotype those those studies are still uh science fiction those those have not made it to the mainstream we have done some in mice and we've talked about some of those on twim already but um putting those into people ha- have not yet been uh done to any level of rigor that would warrant Warren placement in the New England Journal, and before you go out and do do it yourself, remember the first rule of all physicians: do no harm. So you don't know what you may end up with. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I would strongly dissuade anybody from doing something like this. Yeah. Not a good idea. So he took antibiotics, which in itself could be problematic, and then right. he he took saliva, skin, and feces from his friend, and uh, from a donor. And so you don't know what happens. The film actually ends with him after having doing this. We don't know the outcome, of course. But this film was made by um, a couple of filmmakers. It was shown in the San, in the San Francisco International Film Festival and South by Southwest. <laughs> Basically a documentary. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, don't try this at home, right? right? Our last one is from Wink, who writes, I have interrupted my morning walk because I think you contradicted yourself on TWIM. You said that you are evolutionarily superfluous when you can't reproduce. Yet, your podcast leads to the increased survival of humans you will never meet. Thanks for keeping our species going. Thank you very much. Very nice. That's lovely. Thank you, Wink. All right, that is TWIM152. You can find it at Apple Podcasts. You can find it at asm.org slash TWIM. Consider subscribing through your mobile device. And so you get every episode whenever we release it. And 
think about becoming a patron of Twim. You know that the Medicis were great patrons of the artists of the Renaissance. You can be patrons of podcasts like Twim. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. And we have a number of ways you can help us, including Patreon, PayPal, etc. We really appreciate your support. And of course, send us your questions and comments. Twim at microbe.tv. Elio Schechter can be found at the wonderful blog, Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it greatly. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina, where school is out. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Elio. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. If you like his work, you can find it all at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>